a lot of uh, behaviors in the world that are statistical actually ha have the behavior of the normal curve in the following sense. This symbol mu here, um, is, that's the average. So when you say uh, the average income is such and such or the average IQ is such and such, what you're talking about is this middle point. So let's use the example of IQ. If we did an IQ test of everyone in the, in, let's say, in the United States, we would have an average that comes right here. And then if we start saying, well, let's suppose uh, on the x-axis we put the IQ level, so this is just the average IQ, and on the y-axis we put how many people had that IQ. So we start piling it in, and most people, if you see the highest point is at the peak where mu is. That's where the high point of the little mountain is. And that's to say that most people have IQs that are at the average, and they kind of cluster around the average. And these percentages here are telling you what percent of the people are in that distance from the average. So for example, if you say, well, how many people have IQ between this value and this value, you would say, well, it's 34.1% plus 34.1%. And that sigma value, this, this uh, sigma is the distance between mu and mu minus sigma, and also between mu and mu plus sigma. That sigma is what's called a standard deviation. So if we say that everyone, uh, we, we say what percentage of people have IQ within one standard deviation of the, me the mean, the answer would be, on a normal curve, would be 68.2%. So the idea of a normal curve is that most of the time when you, sample, when you sample somebody, they end up in this blue region. And if you want to get really most everyone, 95.4%, they would end up with an IQ between here and here. And then there's a very small number of people who will have IQs way out there or way out here. Okay, So that's the idea of a normal curve. And I wanted to bring this up because this concept of a normal curve um, is something that's really quite ubiquitous within statistics and in thinking about it. And it's something that comes up many, 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 many times. And if you understand this curve, you can really frame a lot of your, the, the, uh, the questions about statistics in terms of this curve and understand what it is that people are talking about. So now I want to talk about something very, um, uh, very political and the role of science in a political discussion. Um, this has to do with the deaths from the Iraqi war. So some of you know that a few years ago, um, Lancet did some reports on the number of people, Iraqi people, who were killed um, after the US invasion. And I actually want to talk of not about the most recent reports, but actually about one that, occur that was uh, published in 2004 about um, deaths that occurred between 2003 and 2004. Um, and The Lancet came out with a report that was considered quite controversial within media circles that approximately 98,000 excess deaths, so that's compared to how many would have died had there not been um, a war, and uh, was 98,000. And they said that there was an error margin and the number, the true value could be expected to be between 8,000 and 196,000. Now, what did the media take from this? And I, I really want to kind of point out this. So, so a lot of people were very political about how they responded to it. People who are opposed to the war spent a lot of time talking about how awful this was and how correct these predictions were. People who um, felt uh, pro-war were uh, very suspicious of these numbers and felt that there were all sorts of problems in the statistical methods. Uh, all of a sudden, conservative pundits became experts in statistics and were able to dismiss these studies. And it was crazy. So I don't want to go into like all the details about this, but what I do want to say is that the pre press report it was just as likely as to be 8,000 as to be 98,000. Um, and this is really an incorrect statement. And let me put up there that normal curve again to give you a sense of how improbable that is. So a normal curve is also really good for sampling. And the idea is that if we sample something and we get 98,000, what we're saying is that is the most likely value. It is much less likely that the number is going to be 8,000 than it is going to be 98,000 if you believe the methods of the study, which again, like I'm saying, there, had, there were considerations about that. But, but this kind of comment that it's just as likely is a gross misunderstanding of what statistics mean when we do a sample and we do a measurement. Um, so Bush called the methods controversial. 
And I would say that they're fairly standard methods in epidemiology. Um, they're are some reasons to believe that the methods were controversial. In particular, the authors of the study were very overtly anti-war. That did not help their situation in terms of people's suspicion about their methods. Um, and if you really look at their methods carefully, there are some issues to go into, which I won't hear. But I do want to point out that the idea that it was controversial in a superficial way, which I think is what uh, Bush is saying, was really not a fair assessment from a scientific point of view. Um, so let me bring up a few other political actions that were based on science. Um, one is a move that's gone on, it's gotten quite a lot of attention recently to ban a class of chemicals called phthalates from toys. Um, phthalates are, uh, have been considered quite a lot in um, scientific studies. They are these chemicals that are found in plastics that make them kind of malleable. They're also in cosmetics. They help smell stay on you longer. Um, and there has been some concern that they can cause problems. Um, I actually have done this talk in which I've gone into great lengths about some of the coverage about it because there have been a lot of media claims that they cause genital defects <laughs> when in fact there's no evidence of that at all. But there is some evidence that they could cause some harm. Um, however, most of our exposure to phthalates, if you look at the um, NIH reviews of the toxicologies, so toxicologists who have re done scientific panels on phthalates, turns out that most of our exposure comes through food and dust. So if you were concerned about phthalates, banning, toy, banning phthalates from toys actually does extraordinarily uh, little to help that. They were concerned about babies chewing on toys. They did studies on how much babies chew from toys and how much of these products could leach into um, small children and found very, very little is the answer. So at best, um, this is something that would just placate uh, people but wouldn't actually have any consequences. Um, uh, that, that would be the best case scenario if we think phthalates are bad for you. Um, I, I personally think that some of the science on it is, is again, over-exaggerated, but there's been some recent work um, that I haven't had time to review entirely, which suggests that there is some concern for some of these uh, things. But the worst phthalates, the people that, are, that NIH is most concerned on, is in fact not even put into toys. Okay, so I just want to give you a perspective on legislation now that is going into um, to banning them from toys. It is expensive for American industry, and unfortunately, I think does very little to help a problem that may or may not exist. Um, another big uh, political action that's based on science is No Child Left Behind. So what I want to, I, I want to make a couple comments about this because um, some people might disagree with me. The mandate of No Child Left Behind is to impl implement um, um, uh, programs where you can sci scientifically prove that, th that you're not leaving children behind. And that's the impetus behind why it is that there's so much testing that goes on um, to prove that your children are improving or to prove that you've left no child be left behind. So there's this mandate um, for science to prove. And what that means is that you're going to look for cost-effective means to test people, test kids in their educational uh, progress and uh, unfortunately the data is really poor and I'm going to actually talk about that a little bit later with a very specific example in math um, so let me just leave that here. Another political action that's based on uh, science and I put it in quotations because it's bad science um, is recommendations regarding alcohol consumption, consumption for pregnant and nursing women. Um, which isn't to say that alcohol is not harmful for pregnant and nursing women. It's well established in large quantities that for pregnant women it is very harmful. Um, so I'm not trying in any way to put this down, but if you look at small amounts of alcohol consumption and even fairly large amounts while nursing, the evidence is extremely poor. And in fact, I would go to such lengths as to say they have not found any evidence that it's actually um, bad for you to consume alcohol, small amounts of alcohol, moderate amounts, small to moderate amounts of alcohol while pregnant and even fairly large amounts while nursing. I think some of the most really alcoholic women while nursing have, they've, they've been able to show that there's some problems. Um, so, uh, but I, I think that this again, um, as someone who has ordered a drink while pregnant and being told all sorts of things, you know, it's really annoying that people don't understand the research. 